Stanley liked to explore the edges of everything, the farthest out edges of everything that was primal but controlled in civilization. You could look at that film, come into the theater, and if you've ever seen any of Kubrick's other films, and you didn't know where you were, you would know it was a Kubrick film. And I'll smash your face for you, your blockos. <laughs> There was your faithful narrator, being held helpless like a babe in arms. I was cured, all right. Well, I think the first thing that made Stanley Kubrick so special was he was a chameleon. He, he never made the same picture twice. Every single picture is a different genre, a different period, a different story, a different risk. Well, I think he would choose projects that would pique interest. You know, the idea of James Mason with a 13-year-old in the 60s was very challenging to society. Terry Southern gave Stanley Kubrick a copy of the novella, A Clockwork Orange, written by Anthony Burgess, when they were working together on the set of Dr. Strangelove. He gave a copy to Kubrick and said, you should read this, it was really great. And Kubrick read it, and he just didn't get it. The problem was the language of it, you know, the NADSAT, the language that Burgess had developed for the book. We go around, shop cresting and the like, coming out with a pitiful rooker full of money pitiful each. Pitiful rooker full. And there's Will the English and the muscle man coffee mester Will saying he can fence anything that any male chick tries to crest. Yeah. Kubrick felt nobody's going to read this, nobody's going to watch this, nobody's going to understand this. So he rejected the idea of the project. Kubrick was always very, very aware of where he stood in the pecking order. And, and he knew that, that people regarded him as being out there doing something innovative. And yet here were these kids kind of coming in and doing stuff that he'd never thought of. He had the idea, all right, let them make their youth film. Then I'll come in and I'll make the great youth film. Stanley Kubrick wanted to push the envelope. I don't think Stanley Kubrick was interested in the ordinary. I think the ordinary bored him. Kubrick took over the project, A Clockwork Orange, after making 2001. It had all the things that he liked. It had a great plot. It was short. It had a lot of action. And, you know, as he said, it had one of the greatest characters that it had ever been committed to fiction. Almost a figure as evil and untouchable and engaging as Richard III. Now they knew who was master and leader. Sheep, thought I. But a real leader knows always when like to give and show generous to his unders. He first of all decided that he did need a screenplay and he got Burgess to write one. And he threw it out. Uh, he decided he could do better himself. He said, I've got the book, all I have to do is use the book. So instead of carrying around a big screenplay, we carried around the book which was a new way of making movies. He would go on the set, he'd open the book, he'd say, OK, page 27, we're going to do that today. How would, how would we do that? And then he'd sit down with the actors and the technicians and they would work out the way to do it. Now, the irony of this, of course, is that when Kubrick actually made the film, he followed the novel extremely closely, using all that language, which he said would be rejected and nobody would understand. Now, globby bottle of cheap stinking chip oil come and get one in the yarbles if you have any yarbles your eunuch jelly thou anthony burgess he invented this futuristic slang of the street kids of london which he called nadzat which is more or less teen uh, in russian yarbles great bolsy yard blockos to you it consists of Corrupted Russian, about 200 words of corrupted Russian, Cockney rhyming slang, and certain gypsy and Roman equilocalisms. And there's Will the English and the muscle man coffee mester saying English. he can fence anything that any male chick tries to crest. Yeah. The shiny stuff, the, shiny the ice. Stuff. 
In the film, Kubrick uses language, but he uses much less of it. And he always supports the language with a visual image. So the first shot of the film, which is this extraordinary close-up on Alex, the camera pulls away, and then you hear the voiceover of Alex, and he explains who he is. There was me, that is Alex, and my three droogs. If you don't know what a droog is, you see these three guys sitting with him so you can figure it out. And we sat in the Corova milk bar trying to make up our Razoo docs what to do with the evening. Let's get things nice and sparkling clear. Stanley Kubrick would have seen Malcolm McDowell in Lindsay Anderson's If. Malcolm McDowell had the sort of the boyishness, the lovable, in spite of his badness, quality about him that Kubrick would have felt was key and that perhaps no other actor could have had. The combination of, of velvet and violence, of, 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 of snobbery and violence. He's like a child. Uh, and I mean that in the nicest way, in the most positive way. <laughs> Malcolm does unbalanced very well. I mean, he does extreme personality disorder very well. I think the only other person at the time who was ever considered for the part, although this was before Kubrick became involved, was Mick Jagger. At one point there was an idea that Jagger would play Alex and that the rest of the Rolling Stones would play the Droogs. Kubrick did say that if Malcolm McDowell hadn't been available, he probably wouldn't have made the movie. I'm completely reformed! <laughs> In a way, McDowell never played another, another role after that. He played that role forever and ever because it fitted him so well. Hello, Lucy. Had a busy night. We've been working hard, too. Pardon me, Luce. When I went to meet Stanley and I said, what's the budget for the film? He said, well, it's going to be tight. And I go, well, how tight? He goes, well, here it is. And I looked at the front page and I was horrified. And I looked at Stanley and I said, is this for real? You're Stanley Kubrick. He goes, yeah, I know, I know, I know. He said, we've got to make it. He said, I've got to make a breakthrough and show him I can do a low-budget picture. It's very interesting. When Kubrick made this film, he decided to shoot as much of it on location as he could. So he and uh, his associates sat down with a pile of architectural magazines and began scouting locations. He was imagining the future on a very small scale. So rather than build some kind of like futuristic apartment block, the idea was to use the, the worst possible apartment block that you could find in the 1960s in, in London. And there, you know, at that stage, there was a lot of them being thrown up. They did not want to do a futuristic movie in a traditional science fiction way. He wanted something which was uh, tomorrow, today, maybe near. I knew he wanted the movie to be timeless. Hi, 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 Mark And so we tried to give a look that was uh, also possible to recreate. The street gangs in those days were all wearing clothes. They would put themselves together. They were not going to some costume house and do some extraordinary high-tech, futuristic things. The gangs of that day and the gangs of today, they're very inventive, but they do it with ordinary things. And I said, you know, this is so anti-government. You know, Stanley, you're an American, but for me as a Brit, if you put a bowler hat on that guy, I said, that's really shoving it to the politicians. And he liked it. Part of the whole thing was also to do something that we actually thought these guys would do to themselves, because it was almost like tribal decoration, because they were, indeed, a tribe. And I had some fake eyelashes, because this is the early 70s. I mean, they were probably mine, you know, in the box. And uh, I suddenly thought, this could be the thing, you know. Perhaps just try an eyelash. We called Stanley, and he, he came over and he said, that's it. I mean, and it was it. It was just the right idea, the right time, and it was very simple, but it just had everything we were looking for. 
If he thought somebody had a valid opinion about anything, even if it wasn't their department, you know, their area, he'd be interested in it. If there was a guy sweeping the floor who had something to say about the quality of, I don't know, something else, you know, Stanley would want to hear him. And he would say to me also, Bernie, when you get the scripts out, give it to the guy in the door. I go, really? You mean the doorman? He goes, yeah. He goes, if anybody comes up with one idea that's great, I want to hear it. He had no doubt about who was in control. He didn't feel threatened. You never knew when somebody was going to come up with a good idea, so he listened to everybody. That was why he's such a great director. I mean, he was just a big sponge, you know. All the information would just come in, and he'd sort of work it all out. Well, put it this way. I feel very low in myself. I can't see much in the future. And I feel that any second, something terrible is going to happen to me. Kubrick, I would say, gives a new definition to the word controlling. From the writing, through the casting, to the shooting, to the editing, to the use of music. I mean, he's so profoundly involved in every aspect of the film. He was the producer, the director, the writer, the cameraman, the sound man, <laughs> the designer. I mean, he was in everyone's department. So we have this one-man band on the set. He just did everything in the movie business better than anybody else. Kubrick had a unique relationship with Warner Brothers. The respect in which he was held was staggering. We would do what I wanted to do, and I wanted to do what Stanley told me to do. Stanley was a perfectionist. He was the one true 1,000% perfectionist that I ever worked with. We would always spend a lot of time with the lighting, which is the one thing I really loved that Stanley always did was take a lot of time setting the scene. Stanley would spend a lot of time rehearsing. I mean, you could go to work at six in the morning and not roll that camera till two in the afternoon, but then he'd want to shoot at midnight, and he did. He just took it. If you didn't want long days, then he didn't work for Stanley Kubrick. Yeah, I never saw my children for, for, for ages. I mean, they would be in bed when I left, and they would be in bed when I come out. He just wants to keep, what if? What if? Is there more? Have you tried everything? Have we really looked? Let's go and look again. I mean, it's constant. Don't resist it, because you're going to have a miserable life. There was no relief. There was no thing saying, well, let's have a night or, off easy, or let's go out for a beer and chat about the film. It was bang, bang, bang. Malcolm was getting tired. <laughs> Stanley was like, what's wrong with this guy? You know, we're out all day, and... These actors go to their dressing rooms and we have to stay out in the cold and the rain and we have to be hardy and these actors, you know. So. People do get knocked around on, 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 uh, on Kubrick movies, you know, it's, a, it's part of the game. I do this and that and this because I don't like your horrible type, do I? And if you want to start something, if you want to start, well, you just go ahead. Go on. Please do. He was very attracted to the idea of making the aversion therapy to look realistic. And to this end, he decided to get these clips that, that hold open the, the eyes, metal clips. So Paul Malcolm is sitting there with a straight jacket on, with these clips holding his eyes wide open. Now, you just stand yourself like that. See how long you can stand it for. Well, 30 takes later, and your eyes are still clipped, and you've got these bump, 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 to keep them moist. So, at one point, Malcolm couldn't take it any longer. And he just, I mean, he just panicked, screamed, or was angry. I don't know what it was. Stop it! Stop it, please! I beg you! Ah! Ah! He just wrenched his arms to try and get out of the straitjacket. And in doing so, he, he hit one of the clips. And that scratched his cornea. And of course, he was in hell. He was in pain. I was in just so much pain. And uh, that was the end of that scene. 
Another one was the scene where he's taken by his old, uh, his old friends and brutalised and they dump him head first into a trough of water for pigs. And I was watching this scene, I went, is this for real? Because it goes on forever and ever. And it was freezing cold. I mean, England's not like California. It's freezing cold. And he's laying on clay ground, which is soaking wet, freezing cold with a skimpy outfit on. Kubrick had had the water made up by colouring it with a meat extract. And uh, Malcolm complained, you know, that after 27 takes of being dunked in this terrible cold soup, you know, that, that he, was, he was utterly revolted by the smell of this thing forever. Hats off to Malcolm. He was in every scene. I mean, he, he did well. <laughs> oh? And what's so stinking about it? It's a stinky word because there's no law and order anymore. <laughs> it's a stinky word because it lets the young get onto the old. <laughs> Who on earth could that be? Though there is not a lot of blood and vivid, explicit uh, savagery. The idea of a group of thugs breaking into the home of an elderly couple and beating the shit out of them is one of the most disturbing things you can put on film. The idea that your own home is not a safe haven is much more disturbing than if you would see someone being stabbed with a knife or shot with a gun, which you now see every night on television in profusion. You know, all of the television shows have become way more graphically violent than Clockwork Orange was. Yet why are they not as disturbing? It's because Clockwork Orange <laughs> goes to the deepest fears of human beings, that they're not safe in their own homes, no matter what, that the law can't protect them. I'm sorry, but we don't usually let strangers in. <laughs> <laughs> Stanley had a way of looking at violence as he had a way of looking at sex, too. Um, and, he, you know, in a certain way, he, he wasn't pulling punches. He was pushing punches. I mean, he, he waded straight into sex, and he waded straight into violence. But it managed to be stylized. It managed to be not like walking in a room and discovering two people beating the hell out of each other or two people having sex. It wasn't like that. It's interesting because in Clockwork Orange, which a lot of people consider to be a very violent film, I mean, the, you know, most of the violence is very stylized. The one time when he actually kills the woman, you actually cut to a an image of a painting from the woman's house as opposed to actually seeing someone get killed. Boom! <laughs> you know, and that is, uh, that's much more impactful. Stylized violence is often easier on the senses. It's easier to watch without feeling quite so affected by it. Kubrick will often times counterpoint things with with music or with visual images that have a sophistication I mean there's a there's a wonderful scene in Clockwork Orange where you know these this horrible gang is is raping this girl on a stage in a theater but you start out with these beautiful architectural images and then you just pull back and pull back until you realize you're looking at a at a proscenium and these these guys are beating up this girl Right, get out of here.
It was around by the derelict casino that we came across Billy Boy and his four droogs. They were getting ready to perform a little of the old in out, in out. They'd shot for about three days and Kubrick wasn't happy with the sort of stylized destruction of the writer's house and the assault on him and his wife. He thought it was flat, it was static, it wasn't working. He asked Malcolm McDowell in this early discussion, do you, do you know any songs? And, and uh, McDowell said, I only know one, it's singing in the rain. And Kubrick said, OK, wait a minute. He was rehearsing for days, this sequence, and it just wasn't working. And the next minute, I'm hearing... <laughs> and I went, what, 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 what are we doing now? Is this a musical? And he starts shooting it. And I said, Stanley, we have to get permission. He goes, well, get onto the studio. I go, no, no, Stanley, this is a famous song. You're raping and beating up two people who've done nothing to anybody in their own house to singing in the rain. He goes, Bernie, just get on with it. It's awesome to see that as a filmmaker, to see a beating being inflicted on people while Gene Kelly is singing Singing in the Rain on the soundtrack. It messes up the circuitry of, of the viewer's mind. It's a key scene in terms of audience complicity. The first time I saw the film, I laughed and then was deeply shocked and embarrassed at myself for laughing. You shouldn't, but it is so unexpected. It's one of those things which, having seen Clockwork Orange, you can never see Gene Kelly singing, singing in the rain again quite the same way. It affects your perception of that. They pulled it off. I'm sure Gene, Gene Kelly wasn't too happy about it, but... <laughs> <laughs> There are a lot of legends about, about the release of Clockwork Orange. There's a lot of legends about uh, the release of all Kubrick's movies, I suppose. Um, it, 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 when it came out, it, it was fairly widely uh, disparaged as being extremely unpleasant. Malcolm McDowell's performance is a tour de force. And critics of the film those who dislike the film very much dislike the fact that his performance is so powerful because it is engaging, because it does draw in viewers and allow them, maybe despite themselves, despite their own natures, despite their own sense of, of what's fair uh, or what's moral, they, they are rooting for him. He's a bad kid. I mean, he does some pretty horrible things. And yeah, we're having fun watching him do it, Kubrick had a couple of bad experiences with, um, first of all, with screenings of the film, with people misunderstanding the, or, or people enjoying the violence of it. They, they felt that it was sort of giving them a rush. And it was seen as being responsible for youth crimes at the time. Every youth crime was blamed on, a, on the film of Clockwork Orange. Teenagers after the film came out, started telling judges, you know, I was influenced by Clockwork Orange, that's why I did it, sir. A Clockwork Orange made violent youth culture attractive for, for many young people around the world. I don't think he set out to incite violence, but I know that the film did. There were several incidents in the UK, uh, incidents of ultra-violence. The first was the attack and rape of a Dutch girl holidaying in Lancashire. The gang of youths who attacked her actually chanted singing in the rain while the attack occurred. There's a clear link to the film. I'm quite sure that Stanley was terribly, terribly, terribly hurt by the reaction to Clockwork Orange and felt that it was completely misunderstood. That got too close to home for him when they started blaming uh, him on Clockwork Orange for violence in the, in the country. You have to say that Kubrick could not have seen that coming, but once it did come, he recognized it. Kubrick then 
quietly and not telling anybody, withdrew the film. He just felt that he didn't want to bear the burden of responsibility for violent crime. And that's why Stanley pulled the movie two years after it came out. And it was never shown in England for probably 25 years. It wasn't me, brother, sir. Speak up for me, sir, for I'm not so bad. I was led on by the treachery of others, sir. Sings the roof up lovely, he does that. <laughs> no matter my stinking traitorous droogs, get them before they get away. It was all their idea, brothers. They forced me to do it. I'm innocent. It's the same thing when you have somebody that commits a murder and it's shown on the news, and there's somebody out there that wants to copy that same crime and do it. Uh, and they get the ideas from movies, they get them from television, they get them from the news, then they get them from people's actions. We all have a responsibility in the sense that what we do is capable of affecting the way people think. It's propaganda, finally what it is. We all teach, we all set examples. People who make movies or are in the media have a loudspeaker. Some people look at that film and see a great, powerful essay on violence. Other people, possibly even more receptive to motion picture imagery and thought, um, viewed it as a, a blueprint for their own lives. Mm -hmm.